Thank you very much. Um, it's really an honor for me to have been asked to make this presentation. I'd like to really thank uh, you for asking me to be the person who presents on this issue. I'm very, very glad to see so many uh, colleagues from uh, other areas, with, uh, people with whom I've worked here. So um, welcome everybody and thank you. So I've decided to call this anti-gypsyism seeing is believing uh, because I would like us to focus basically on visual aspects of anti-gypsyism uh, as I believe that they are really crucial and could potentially be an avenue for us to develop not just counter speech in the future, but counter visuals, counter images, which are going to be, I think, extremely important in combating this phenomenon. I was asked to very briefly uh, summarize the historical perspective on this phenomenon in the run-up to the Second World War. I want you all to know that there's a wonderful art historian named Sara Kamona who has recently, um, the Council of Europe has issued some of her work in book form. She has been um, reviewing how Romani people have been depicted in the fine arts in European history. And she's, the Council of Europe has just issued a first book um, about how Romani people are depicted in the Louvre. The second volume is probably going to be about the Prado. And this is really about what her work is. It's the genealogy of Romani stereotypes, how Romani people have been visualized by Europeans throughout history. Um, I'd like to touch on what Mark said on Monday. I very much agree that what we are discussing here are cultural patterns and habits of mind that have never stopped operating. They're very, very much part of how Europeans define themselves. Who are the different people of the different nations of Europe? They define themselves in opposition to the caricatures that are represented in anti-Semitism and in anti-Gypsyism. This is part of a much larger intellectual or cultural phenomenon. Others have uh, analyzed this elsewhere, such as Edward Said in his work on Orientalism, on the development of the, the non-European other. And um, a lot of what we're going to be discussing right now is the, the imagery that begins at the same time as the 19th century developing, not just the disciplines of, for example, anthropology and linguistics and all of the social sciences, but the pseudoscience that legitimized racism and that was referred to by the Nazis in their uh, imaginary explanation for why they were doing what they were doing. Cinema, the development of cinema um, in the 19th century I believe was sort of an equivalent uh, bomb of a phenomenon to social media today. And it's important to know that cinema was um, from the very beginning involved in using anti-Romani tropes, anti-Gypsyist tropes. Um, and there's just a few examples here. These come from some really great research that was published in a book that the European Network Against Racism put out. It's called Dimensions of Anti-Gypsyism in Europe. And it discusses a few of these examples and I, I'll just go through them very quickly. Um, one early 20th century film from Britain, which is about um, the, the classic stereotype of gypsies abducting non-gypsy children. It was one of the first, um, sort of contributions to, to the development of the, the crime genre as a genre of entertainment and a, a way as a, of um, moderating to people what acceptable behavior is and isn't. So people would watch these horrible films about what the gypsies did and say, oh, well, we're of course superior to that in every way. Similarly, in the German speaking world, there was a genre um, called the Heimat film. And there are several examples of it listed here, um, also in Denmark, also in Hungary. These were films in which there was a love triangle and the, the non-white uh, potential life partner of the protagonist is rejected in these films. That's the, the arc of the drama is the person goes astray with 
with the ethnic other and then returns to his ethnic group at the end and is rewarded with, you know, happy ending. Um, so it's important that we know about these things because these are the kinds of sort of massaging of cultural expectations and self-identity that led the way to the Nazis being able to make use of certain images in their own propaganda. And the image that you see here on the right of the slide is an image from the US Holocaust Museum. It's a Nazi propaganda article entitled, in translation, Vagabonds, New Ways of Combating the Gypsy Plague, which was the preferred term that they used for uh, dehumanizing uh, Romani people prior to rounding them up and killing them. And if you, have, if you have been already predisposed to view Romani people as anti-civilizational, as outside the norm, uh, as the antithesis somehow of what it means to be a real European, then all the Nazis have to do is put these photographs here of ordinary people in the propaganda and they can expect that you will already see in them the abductor of children um, or the seductress who is going to you know, contaminate the white race, et cetera, et cetera. There are obviously other examples of this from the very beginning of cinema, um, that imagery of this kind is extremely important. So that's how, that, that was the kind of cultural norm building that was taking place in the run up to the Holocaust. What are the parallels to today? to the situations that we find ourselves in today. Um, there are two, in addition to social media, there are two, two aspects of how our production, our cultural production differs uh, and has become even more insidious than what was available to the Nazis. And the first thing I'd like to mention is reality television. This has been around for about 20 years, and it involves these programs in which uh, supposedly real people, they are real people, who are supposedly genuinely members of the groups that they're being asked to represent, um, enact, uh, allow, supposedly allow a film crew into their lives. And you probably know that there are various degrees along which this works. Some, some programs involved very staged events. Um, some are, are more quasi-documentary in nature. There are all kinds of ethical issues that are involved with this. And a, a, a big point of a lot of the production is to engage in this othering of the groups that are being depicted, but in a way that can claim to have the veracity of a documentary film. Yeah? Um, probably there are many examples of this from around Europe. I'm just going to focus on the one that was so popular it even had an American spin-off, and that is this documentary series in the UK which was uh, put out on the public broadcaster called Big Fat Gypsy Weddings. Um, what I think is fascinating about the way this developed is that when it was first broadcast, uh, it, was, it was given a big award as the most groundbreaking show in the Cultural Diversity Awards. And this really, to me, um, highlights the dilemma of representation, the dilemma of visual representation. If a, if a group wants to present themselves and yet not be exoticized, that's very difficult. It's very difficult to do even within the realm of people who believe that they're talking about diversity in some kind of positive sense. Um, the series aired, the second episode was seen by more than 7 million people and it's very problematic. It's promotional material has been complained rightly, in my opinion. Members of these groups have complained that it was racist. It's been accused of increasing to, uh, uh, contributing to racially motiva motivated bullying of the members of these communities. And the British tabloid media response to this has been very, very, um, they, they really used it, yeah? All the images, all the quotes, everything that they could use to generate 
their own coverage of it. Of course, it's supposedly newsworthy because millions of people are watching it. So to generate content, and then to get that content is something that from the tabloids online, people can take and share online and add their own hate speech to it. And uh, traveler people in particular in uh, the UK are uh, an almost invisible group when it comes to recognizing that they are um, people with an, who belong to an ethnic group and who are routinely uh, discriminated against and treated in an anti-Gypsyist way. So reality television poses one problem in terms of the cultural massage that's underway of those of us who consume television. And another aspect is something that I, I'm calling a social media enactment. And this is an example from the Czech Republic. Um, this is a, a self-produced, it doesn't exist on television, but you can, you can sign up for it on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. And it's sort of a sitcom format, um, staged quasi-reality show, except it very clearly lets the viewers know that it's really supposed to be parody and comedy. Um, the non-Romani performers use blackface, they wear wigs. I mean, this is really ancient, ancient racist stereotypes that they're harking back to in doing this. And the content is extraordinarily vulgar. It's, it's extraordinarily crude, extraordinarily vulgar. Um, there's a lot of depictions of, of, of enactments of sexual intercourse, including sexual intercourse with children present. And the entire message is Romani people are uh, crude, vulgar, uncivilized, outsiders, etc. cetera. Um, the Romeo organization has complained more than once in more than one way to Facebook specifically about this. And uh, the last time we did this, we outlined to them which of their community standards we believe this content violates. And uh, Facebook declined to continue the conversation after, after a certain point. They clearly consider this to just be, to fall in the realm of comedy and parody, um, but it's, it's very harmful. And what's especially harmful, in my opinion, is the idea that, um, it's not just mocking the imaginary idea of the gypsy in the Czech society. It's also very much mocking poor people. And this is, uh, this means that even, even Romani people who are members of the middle class, if they want to perhaps display that they can take a joke, will come online and speak up and say, hey, you guys are really funny. And uh, there's not a lot of solidarity that's been generated about why this is harmful, harmful content. Um, so the parallels, in my opinion, are this kind of cultural output that people can then share and use to base their hate speech on. So what are the challenges? I'm going to just uh, very briefly take about 10 minutes more and then we'll do questions. In my opinion, the widespread social acceptance of anti-Gypsyist thinking is the, is the biggest challenge that we face right now. We're in the very beginning phases, as far as I can tell, of making the argument that this is all socially harmful and that it should not be tolerated. We're also at a moment where we are experiencing a backlash against anti-racism as a movement. Um, I think the world news definitely shows that this is the case. Um, authority figures in all of our societies, especially politicians, make anti-Gypsyist statements, not just with impunity, but they, they time the making of the statements exactly to win elections. In this, uh, this, is a, this is really a European phenomenon. It's not just a matter of societies in Central and Eastern Europe. It's really from Finland to Spain. This is something that happens and nobody responds to it the way they would respond if another group were being targeted because anti-Gypsyism is still not considered racism 
by, by, by most Europeans if they've ever even heard of it. Um, we also face the challenge that disinformation as a tactic of psychological warfare, which is being aimed to destabilize the democracies in which we live, is resurging. This is an enormous problem that the European Commission has been following and that others who are involved in security have been following for some time. And indeed, we see the resurgence of autocratic and authoritarian leaders in the Euro-Atlantic space. And I would argue that this means that we're, it's not just actually the, 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 the past harms that we are uh, in danger of forgetting, we are in danger of not recognizing incipient harms in all of our democracies. Although the events of the recent weeks certainly seems to make it clear that that is what is going on. Uh, in Hungary, in Poland, in the United States. Um, lastly, I'd just like to note that the fact that journalists themselves reproduce anti-gypsyist visuals um, when they frame content uh, is something that we, we really need to address with members of that profession. I just want to give you an example of why I have these two images here. Uh, earlier this year, when the pandemic began, I authored an article for an online uh, newspaper about the fact that Roma Week at the European Parliament had to be canceled. Um, and I sent them the visual at the top that you see there, which is about Roma Week. Uh, it features the iconography that the organizers of Roma Week chose to use. And it, it's relevant to the article that I wrote. And the editor, on the other end, chose to use not, not this exact picture, but one very similar to it, because it's a picture of Roma. Yeah, now, maybe these people in this photograph are Roma, maybe they aren't, I don't know, but we see the anti gypsyist tropes here. They're outside, not inside, in the uncivilized space, they are other, other, other. And um, so I had to contact them and say, please remove this image. I do not want my name on an article with this image on it. And uh, I'm not disputing that maybe these people really are Roma in Sweden five years ago, but this has nothing to do with what I wrote my article about. And these are the images that we need to stop curating when they're not relevant to what is being discussed. I have to say that they were very professional, this particular media outlet. They took the, the offensive, to me, offensive image down and replaced it with the one that I had asked them to use in the beginning. But it took forever for them to remove this image from all of their social media platforms. It had gone out into the space. So um, this is something that we really need to work on because I don't think someone who, may, maybe someone will be, will share an article with that first image and say, oh good, we hate Roma anyway, why are they coming to Brussels? But for sure they'll still share that second Im image which meets their anti gypsy stereotypes. Um, just a, a few more notes. Uh, we were asked to mention or to discuss anti-gypsyism in education, and here I'd just like to remind us all that um, materials about anti-gypsyism or removing particular materials from education is really only one part of the problem. Anti-gypsyism is produced and reproduced through European education systems uh, across the continent. Um, the segregation of Romani children away from non-Romani children, whether at whatever level, within a classroom, within a school, or within a school system, all of this perpetuates the anti-gypsyism that we've been discussing. And um, uh, on Monday, Mark mentioned, you know, human rights as the sort of the, the larger framework within which this discussion really could and should be framed. And I, I must agree with that. Um, I think that Pressing for more education about human rights in school systems is something that can definitely be a vehicle for educating people about anti-gypsyism. There's a publication by the, from the Council of Europe called Mirrors, um, which emphasizes a few aspects of 
the human rights framework and why it's important, namely that human rights are universal. Uh, this, is a, this is really a concept that is under attack and that I believe needs to be vociferously defended. And, uh, and also that taking action is empowering. We need to, we need to show people that um, or convince them, persuade them and help them find a way to act against anti-Gypsyism and in, in defense of human rights and not let this become um, some kind of strange hobby activity. This is something that should be uh, part of being a citizen in a democracy. Uh, lastly, we were asked to speak about media literacy and anti-Gypsyism. I just wanna share this definition with you of media literacy that I found from some um, materials in the United States the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, create, and act using different forms of media. Access is a really big problem, I think. We learned this recently during COVID-19 that actually there are many Romani communities that cannot afford to access the online world of media. And uh, the, the idea to me is rather sickening that um, People with that access are using the internet to share, for example, products like Yoshka YouTuber, which I showed you a few slides back, um, to laugh about people who have no access. And this, this, the inequality of access, the digital divide is something that's a very big problem, I think. Um, when people cannot analyze, when they don't have the schools, uh, skills, when no one's taught them this, then disinformation and hoaxes work very well. And this is something that I think we also, if we, if we consider this work not to just be narrowly focused on fighting each in, instance of online hate, but more broadly taking into account how do we prepare people to become haters online or not. Um, educating people, and I mean all, all people in the public school system, not just those on the track to become academics and intellectuals, but everybody in how to read media is extremely important and that's something that we should consider um, investing, investing time in. A, a media literate consumer will recognize the visual strategies that are being used by people to distort communication and reporting. And in my opinion, we as a as civil society are still at the very beginning of educating, especially media producers and consumers about anti-Gypsyist visuals. We need, to, we need to make these depictions as socially unacceptable as other kinds of caricatures now are or should be. Um, there were times when, you know, if you go back to the early 20th century, you will see many examples of visual output that would not be tolerated any longer today by editors. And um, that's, we, we need to begin that process, in my opinion, for images that are anti-Gypsyist.